Amen. All right. Proverbs chapter 31. Of course, great chapter in the Bible. We've studied through Proverbs chapter 31. Can somebody turn these lights on here? It's a little dark in here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31. So this morning, I know that we've looked at um, the virtuous woman before in a sermon series and, and before in the last year. But this morning, I want to talk about a specific subject. And the subject I want to talk about this morning is the subject of feminism. Feminism is a big deal today, and it is, um, you know, kind of, it's overtaken the country, and it's kind of the, the normal thinking today out in the world. So I want to discuss feminism, and the reason that we, wrote, uh, we read Proverbs chapter 31 is because the first thing I want to do is I want to just do a, a compare and contrast this morning on what the Bible says that women should be like, what the Bible says women's roles should be, and then what feminism says that those roles should be, that women should be like, how they should act, look, all these different things, what the Bible says, compare and contrast that, and then let's look at the results. Because we've got a lot of results we can look at today. I mean, we have people living this lifestyle. People are living according to what feminism is telling them that they should do and act and, and, and prosecute their lives in a certain way. Let's look at what those results are. So the first thing I want to look at is Proverbs chapter 31 and other places in the Bible about what you know the Bible says a woman should be like. The Bible is very specific on the roles of men and women. So let's go ahead and look at some traits of Proverbs chapter 31 and other places in the Bible about traits of women and ladies in the Bible. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Look at verse number 11. First of all, the Bible says, um, of this virtuous woman, it says, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that she shall have no, he shall have no need for spoil. So first of all, this woman is trustworthy. And she's trustworthy it, in the Bible, is specifically saying here that her husband trusts her. Okay, look at verse 15. The Bible says in verse 15, she riseth also while it is night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So she works hard. I mean, this woman is a, is a hard-working woman, and of course, what is the context that she's working hard for? She's working hard for her family, for her household. Okay, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. So this woman, I mean, this virtuous woman, I mean, it actually talks about the physical ability of this woman as well. She's physically strong. She's in good shape. Why? for her family, once again, okay? Now look, I mean, it, it doesn't say what she should look like specifically. It doesn't say this woman is, you know, this weight or whatever. It says, no, she's in, she's strong. She's able to do work and not, I mean, because if you're not in shape, look, if you're not in shape, there's a lot of things you're not gonna be able to do. I mean, even recreational things. I mean, yesterday, we're out and just doing recreational things, and by the time you get home and get things cleaned up and all this kind of, I mean, I, I mean I'm done. I told my wife, I was like, I think I need to be in better shape. You know, because you just, it's just hard. There's many things if you're not in good shape that you will not be able to do. That's the bottom line. All right, so this woman, she works hard for her family. She's strong. For her family, which means that you know, taking care of your family as a woman is going to—it's going to need you're going to need physical strength to do that. So you're like, well, I don't ever get out of a chair all day. Well, you're not. There's something you're missing, then, because it takes physical strength. Many times, my wife will just be just physically exhausted by the end of the day. So I mean, that is what's going on with this woman. She needs to be strong. So we say that you know she's physically strong, she's trustworthy, she works hard, and look at verse number 21. It, get, it goes even deeper and deeper into this. In verse number 21 it says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So look, she doesn't, this woman is, is selfless. Okay, she's willing to sacrifice her own comfort. She'll go out in the weather, she'll do all these different things to make sure that her family is comfortable. So she's a selfless person for her family, for her household. Verse 26. And this is an interesting one. Verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. So, this woman is also, she's careful with what she says. And she's wise in her words, which we know that in the Bible, that if you're wise with your words, the Bible equates, you know, knowing what the Bible says to wisdom itself. 
So this woman is well-versed in the Bible. You know, of course, we know that, that, that we're all commanded to be well-versed in the Word of God. So she knows what the Bible says. She's wise in her words. And, you know, she's kind in her words. She's a, she's a kind woman. It says, in her tongue is the law of kindness. This is kind of like the opposite of being loud and obnoxious, by the way. Okay, look at verse 28. And because of all these things, because of all these things, look at verse 28. The Bible says, Her children arise, arise up and call her blessed, and her, her husband also, and he praiseth her. So this woman, I mean, so as we go through, you know, the sermon this morning, please don't misunderstand me when I, you know, this woman is very honored. She's in a position of high honor with everyone that is close to her, her household, her family, her children, her husband. I mean, the Bible talks about that, that she is just a, she's very high as far as people thought of her. She's praised, the Bible says. And look, notice how everything in Proverbs chapter 31, though, has a purpose. It doesn't say she works hard. It doesn't say she's kind in her words. It doesn't say, you know, she's in, you know, she's strong, you know, so she can run marathons. It's, it's all like for a purpose here. I mean, the Bible in Proverbs 31 is saying that she has all these attributes and it's for her family. It's for her husband. He's, he's the one that's trusting her. Trusting her with what? With her family. With the family. With the household. Okay? She doesn't just keep herself in shape so she can just look good. You know, it's for her family. Okay? She's... I mean, she's doing all these things for the purpose that God has appointed her to. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. And look, for that reason, she's greatly appreciated by those people. This woman is held in very high regard. I mean, that sounds like a great place to be. If the people closest to you have great respect and great honor for you, I mean, look, that's what we're all after, isn't it, in our lives? Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number 1. There's other things that the Bible says about, you know, how a woman should be. Let's keep looking into this so we can contrast what feminism teaches. Look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subject to your own husbands, in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. I mean, look, this is a pretty important role. This is saying that, look, if your husband is not either, maybe he's not saved or maybe he's, you know, not obeying the word, the Bible says that that husband can literally be won over by the conversation of his wife if she's acting in a certain way. And then it says in verse number two, be, while they behold your chaste conversation. Here we see the words and how important the words of a woman are, or the words of a wife in this case are. Those words again are chaste. That means clean and pure. Okay, she's careful with what she says. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, "Whose adorning let it not be that out, outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel." So it's saying, look, it's just it's not all about looks. That's how we know that the strength part. It's not all just about just looks, which we'll go into that today too. I mean, that's what the world's teaching today. It's just it's all about looks, okay? But it's not about looks. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. Talking about the hidden person of the heart here. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So the Bible says here for a woman to be meek and quiet is a great price of great value to the Lord. That is her beauty. Her beauty is of her heart. Okay, it's what is in her heart. Like I said, once again, it's the opposite of being loud and obnoxious. Is being meek and quiet. Look at verse, uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So the world teaches, you know, and I'll get into this, but the world teaches it's all about how you look. Just for the sake of how you look. And the Bible says that what's important for a woman is what's in her heart. Because in that relates directly to what will come out of her mouth. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 34. The Bible says this, it says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience also, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in church. 
So that's why women in a church like this that follows the Bible aren't to amen in church. That's why you hear the men amening, not the women. You say, well, I don't like that. I, don't think, I think that women should be able to amen. Well, that's not what the Bible says. And we preach what the Bible says here. So that's why, I mean, that's why we do things the way we do it, because the Bible says so. It's that simple. Okay, look at Titus chapter 2. Look at Titus chapter 2. Look at verse number 3. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 3. Let's look at some more. I mean, look, is, is the Bible silent? The Bible's very specific on, on the character of a woman and the character of how women are supposed to be. We should be thankful for that, by the way. I mean, if you're a woman today, I mean, the Bible's very specific on how you should be. Look at verse number 3 of Titus chapter 2. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women. Underline that in, in your Bible. So like, ladies, you're an example to the young ladies in the church. If, you're, if you have young ladies watching you, okay, if, and you say, well, am I aged? Well, if someone is younger than you, then in that case, oh, young ladies are watching you. Okay, we'll get into that a little bit further um, this morning as well. Look at verse number five. To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So that, look, they're, they're talking about that the woman is to be a keeper at home. She is to keep the household at home. So, I mean, look, someone has to keep the home. I mean, someone has to keep the home, right? Unfortunately, this is usually just left, either left undone today, or, you know, guess who's at home, by the way? The children are at home. So part of keeping the home doesn't mean you're just vacuuming the carpet. It means you're taking care of the children, is what it means. And most people have just decided that other people can handle this today, that the government can handle this today, and raise their kids for them. Okay? I mean, look, that's not what the Bible teaches. So we're going to contrast a picture here today. So what do we see? We see that women are to be chaste. They're supposed to have pure um, speech. They're supposed to um, be strong for their families. They're supposed to be in subjection to their husbands. They're supposed to have a meek and quiet spirit. That they're, have to, they're supposed to have a pure heart, the Bible says. And the Bible says that this woman is very valuable, by the way. In Proverbs 31.10, it says that this woman, it says, like, who can find her? It's like no one can even find one. Here's how women are supposed to be. You can't even find one. And it says her price. So as we get into some of these things that feminism will teach today, that, you know, the, the feminists will say that all these things devalue women, but the Bible says that this woman's price is far above rubies. Amen. That her value is so high that it can't even have a price put on it. That a woman like this is so rare, is priceless. Right. Is what the Bible teaches. It's almost like the exact opposite of what feminism teaches today. Okay? So look, when, you, when I was reading, ladies, when I was reading these traits, was it you? Is this you? Is the question. Right? Because this is the model that the Bible lays forth for you. Now let's look at the model that feminism lays forth today. So I had to look up. I mean, I already knew this, but I, look, I wanted to be, you know, legitimate, so I went to feminist.org, and I looked up the main tenets of feminism today, okay? So we're just going to step through the main tenets of feminism, but really all the tenets really come from the first one that I'm going to mention here, and the, the main tenet, according to, you know, feminism.org, is equality. You know, all the other tenets really stem from this one, but it's like, it's just equality in everything for men and women. Okay? Now look, you say, well, that, that doesn't sound bad. Well, it, it should sound bad to you, because it is bad. All right? Are men, first of all, are men and women equal? No. The answer to that is no. I mean, the Bible teaches that in marriage they're not equal, in the home they're not equal. I mean, look, in the home, doesn't, first of all, in a marriage, doesn't someone have to be in charge? I mean, I've told the ushers this maybe a million times. When it comes to, you know, managing the things around the church, look, you have to assign somebody to it. Because if everybody's in charge of it, nobody's in charge of it. That's what happens. Because, oh, I thought Brother Trevor was doing it. Oh, I thought you had that. No, somebody has to be in charge. That's why God put someone in charge of the family. That's why the man is to be in charge of the family. Someone has to be in charge, folks. 
If everybody, look, if it's, if it's five people's job to put that book in that center chair every single Sunday, and, and I say to the four ushers, I say it's, it's all of your equals job, it's, it's equally your jobs, it will get left undone at some point. Because somebody thought somebody else was doing it, it's just bad management practice, period. If everybody's in charge, nobody's in charge is the bottom line. Somebody has to be in charge. It's not like they're not equal in marriage. Look, value is not the same as equality. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay, men and women are different. They have different roles. The roles are not equal. Feminism teaches against this. They teach that women are to have the man's role, is what they teach, and compete with him in it, actually because it will end up being a, a competition. Like the workforce is, is number one thing that most of us can think of. You know, I mean, look, can women go to work? Yes, they can. Can women go to work and compete with men? Yes, they can, but should they? The Bible says no, they should be keepers at home, the Bible says. That is the role. Like equality, let's look at how men and women look. Equality in dress. Feminism has been big on pushing for equality in dress and how what we wear and how we look. I mean, men and women, did you know, are actually supposed to look different? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12, or 22, I'm sorry. They're actually supposed to, I mean, God specifically addresses this. But feminism teaches that men and women should look the same. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22 and look at verse number 5. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 5. The Bible says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. It literally says that men and women should look different here. It says that there's clothes that a women, sh women wear and clothes that men should wear, and it should not be the same. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so, look, it, it, he's, he's getting them both here from both sides. Men shouldn't wear what women wear, and women shouldn't mar wear what men wear. It, it's, it's, that, it's very specific. For all that do so are, you know, messing up a little bit. Is that? No. It's like all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Right. That means the Lord hates it. Amen. Abomination is hatred. It's like something that's hated by the Lord. Right. I mean, this, that's, that's, that's the strongest language you can use in the, in the Bible right there. When something is an abomination to God, you don't want to be anywhere near that. I mean, especially if you're saved. I mean, wow. So run from that. Did you know that women wearing pants, by the way, was, you know, that's why we teach that women should wear dresses and men should wear pants. I'm not going to get into all the details of that. But women wearing pants, by the way, was part of the beginning of the feminist movement. Did you know that? It started in like the 1850s. I'm going to read you um, uh, a quote here from a news article about an incident that happened in 1933. In 1933, actress Marlene Dietrich, who, who tantalized audiences as a tuxedo-clad cabaret singer in the 1930 film Morocco, caused a minor uproar by turning up to famed Hollywood hangout, the Brown Derby, in pants. So this woman comes up to this Hollywood um, restaurant, nightclub, or whatever it is, in pants, and the guy wouldn't let her in. Imagine this. I mean, this is just the, the 1930s. Robert Cobb, the restaurant's owner, refused to seat her. On witnessing her rejection, a pair of comedians, Burt Wheeler and Robert Woolsey, left the restaurant and came back in skirts. So you see how it just sparked this reaction? I mean, what are we seeing today, by the way? It was a joke then, but it shows you, you know, how, look, it was a big controversy. And here's the funny thing, is that the controversy was, you know, one of the excuses that were used by women to wear pants was freedom of movements, like sports and like activities and things like that. But look, which, which is ironic, and I'll get into that in, in, a, in a minute. But look, men or women are to look different, is the bottom line. Many of the first women, by the way, to push this movement of women wearing pants were lesbians. And you will see that there's many direct ties to um, the LGBTQ community and feminism. So you say, oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian feminist. Impossible, first of all. And we'll see many reasons why. Okay, look. Birds of a feather flock together, Amen. is all I've got to say. So like, whenever you're in a, in, a, in a movement, by the way, and you're in a movement, you think you're in a movement for good reasons, and there's a bunch of like, unnatural haters of the Lord standing next to you holding signs, maybe you should rethink your position. Right. 
I mean, that's the bottom line. Let's talk about the equal position in the family. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's talk about your head for a minute. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So feminism will teach that women are to have equal position with the man in the family. It's all about equality. See? It's all about equality. Look at verse number 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we could read many, many verses here, but we're just going to read two. The Bible says this, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. So if you have a family and you're married, the head of the woman is her husband, and the head of the man is Christ. That's the order of hierarchy there. Okay, that is the, That's the chain of command, so to speak. And then the Bible says, and the head of Christ is God, and every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. By the way, and then it gets into why women should have long hair, not have short hair, all this. But let me just rip on the men here for a second. This is why men shouldn't wear a cap in church. Amen. Because the Bible says you, you know, it's, it's dishonorable to do that. You know where the military got this idea that you'll never see a military man walk into a building with his, with his cover on? Because it, it, it's, it's biblical. That's where it all stemmed from. It used to be where a man would walk into a building and it was common to take off their hat. You ever see like old um, pictures of old church services from the 1800s? You'll see the women with big hats. And fancy hats, it's fine indoors. But never the men. Right. Because it was considered rude. It's considered dishonorable to have your head, for a man to have his head covered in, in, inside a building. It used to be that way. I mean, especially in a church where you're praying and prophesying. The Bible says it right here. All right? And then the Bible, I mean, the Bible's very clear on why women should have long hair and men should have short hair. Same reason that men shouldn't wear a hat inside. Because then the, the long hair is her covering. Is her covering. All right? Tenet number two, not to get out too off track, back to feminism. Tenet number two of feminism is abortion. Is tenet number two. Okay? Or they'll say, I changed it, okay? It's reproductive rights, is what they wrote. That basically means, you know, the right to murder your unborn children is tenet number two of feminism. So look, the, I mean, it, it makes sense because the feminist teaches that, you know, women can be a harlot, that they can just fornicate freely. You know, they're like, men have been doing it since the beginning of time, so it's our turn now. Right? So look, they teach that. So they teach that the woman should be able to have flippant physical relationships just like a man. The Bible doesn't teach that a man should do that either, by the way. But they're saying, hey, they, can, they should be able to do it just like a man. Thus, we're going to need we're going to need the right to murder our children as that happens. Right? So she'll need that. It's a necessity. It's a necessity. So that's tenet number two. Okay? Now look, the next few, I'm not even going to really get into because they're hijacked causes. Okay, they're hijacked. What do I mean by a hijacked cause? I mean people that just jump onto other people's causes. I'll give you some examples. The next, number three, is racial, injust or racial justice. What does that have to do with feminism? <laughs> it's a hijacked cause. You're like, huh? It's a hijacked cause. They're just jumping onto, you know, somebody else's cause. The next one is the LGBTQ cause. Nothing to do with feminism, but as you can see, there's many ties into it. But look, they're, they're, they're on top of that. Number five is climate change. Hijacked. <laughs> and number six, workers' rights, health care for all, communism. Okay, and I'm not going to get into communism again. I'm, I'm boring you all to death with communism. But look, if you peel enough onions or the layers of the onion back, it always comes down to communism with all these far left things. Every single time. Every single time. So that's basically feminism in a nutshell. So let's look, let's look this morning at the results of feminism. Okay, I want to show you the results of feminism. We know what the Bible says, and we know what feminists want, what they teach, the feminist way. I mean, what are the results? Can we see the results today? Many people are living their life like this, have lived like this for generations, decades, whatever. So the first thing is dress like a man, okay? The first thing is dress like a man, and this one's hilarious to me. It's not really hilarious, but look, the thing is, dress like a man has turned into dress like a harlot. That's what it has turned into. Turn to Exodus chapter 28. Feminism, I think, was, here's a theory, here's a conspiracy theory for you. Feminism, I think, was secretly invented by a man. 
Huh? Well, I'll show you why. Not only has feminism convinced women to be an abomination, but it has also convinced them to, you know, to dress like a harlot, literally. Look at Exodus 28 and verse 42. I mean, the Bible says this. It says, And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. So look, here's what the Bible, and when Peter's out fishing, you can find many places in the Bible that teach this. But look, from here to your knees, if that's uncovered, you're naked. I mean, the Bible would say, literally, that if you have that part of your body uncovered, whether you're a man or a woman, you're naked. Right. That's your nakedness. But it is literally, feminism has literally convinced women to walk around naked. I mean, it's crazy what women and young girls will walk around in today. Yeah. It's crazy what, I mean, look, women's sports, another big push for women to dress like men was women's sports. This is the biggest joke that I have ever seen is this. We're going to convince women that you know, they need to dress like a man because of sporting reasons, and then we'll turn every... This is why feminism it had to have been invented by a, some perverted man. Every single woman's sport, it's like it's the same sport as the men play, and the men can dress normal. But the women, you have to wear your underwear. Isn't that what's going on? Volleyball, soccer, track, whatever. Parents today are a bunch of idiots. That's right. I mean, what are you doing to your daughter? I mean, you sit there and you look at the boys' sport in high school. The boys' team, normal. The girls' team, underwear. Oh, it's necessary, says the you know, 60-year-old coach who's a man of the team. Sicko. It's crazy. It had to have been, I mean... It, it, it's just like a trick invented by perverts that everyone has fallen for. I mean, why can't anyone see this? It drives me nuts. Feminists are like, sounds good. Sounds good. Let's dress our daughters like harlots and parade them in front of a bunch of people. I mean, it's crazy. Turn to Proverbs chapter 7. I mean, how could you even pick out a prostitute today? How would it even be possible? Turn to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7. Look at verse number 9. Proverbs chapter 7, verse number 9. Look what the Bible says. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of subtle heart. Look, being subtle is never good, right? Amen. Having a subtle heart is never good. She is, a, she is loud and stubborn. Kind of like the opposite of meek and quiet. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lying, it lieth in wait at every corner. And it just goes on and on about how evil this woman is. Okay? And look, there's two points here. First of all, what you wear is a reflection of your heart. What you wear is, a, I mean, the Bible tells us here to avoid this woman. She has the attire of a harlot. What you wear is a reflection of your heart. Look, I mean, how many times have you heard this just in general, like dress for the job you want? You ever heard that? I have heard that many times in the business world. They say like, okay, you know, if, you're, if your dress at work is, you know, business casual, you should just up it just a little bit. Maybe wear a collared shirt and a tie every now and then because people will start to see you as the boss. And then, then all of a sudden, you know, you'll eventually be the boss. You know, they say dress for the job you want. I mean, is... is, is do you want to be a harlot? Is that the job you want? I mean, look, no one's going to take you seriously. No one's going to take you seriously if you dress that way. Look, we're trying, and, and here's another thing. You know, we're trying to raise young ladies here in this church. You know, consider what you wear when you walk into a church. Amen. I mean, we're trying to send a specific message. Cover yourself. And look, here's another thing. Everything that you wear, you were influenced by someone. So please think about this. It's not just about us. It's not just about us personally. Everything that you wear, you think about it, you saw an ad on TV, you saw, you know, somebody, something, somebody wearing something that you liked. I mean, everything that you wear, I mean, who was this woman influenced by? Look at verse number 10. It says, there met him a woman with the attire. This woman was, a, a, she was influenced by a harlot for what she wore. It doesn't say she was a harlot. It says she was dressed with that attire. Okay? And now look, People are influenced by you. You think about that? 
People are influenced by what you wear. Other people, and who? What, what do we learn about? Older ladies are going to influence the younger ladies. Look, we're trying to teach a, a methodology here that your value is not, you know, I mean, they're teaching out there that, hey, you girls, you walk around naked and that's your value. That is a bunch of garbage and we're not teaching that here. I mean, these young ladies in the church, and by the way, if you, you will be treated how you dress. You dress like a harlot and they will treat you like a harlot. You dress like a lady. This is one thing my wife noticed when she switched from pants to skirts many years ago, is that people treated her differently. They started treating her like a lady. You're taught your whole life, ladies, that if you, that, hey, just walk around in your underwear. That's what, we want. That's what we want. That's your value. That's a bunch of garbage. That is not your value. Amen. Your value is Proverbs 31. Right. Your value is your heart, period. Amen. It is not you know, your nakedness. These people are lying to you, and they're wicked as hell, Amen. these people. So look, I mean, it, it's, it's a big deal. Look at verse, uh, no, first of all, feminism, by the way, We'll just stay on this one for a minute. Feminism not only treats, teaches women to dress like harlots, it is teaching them to, to live like them. Yeah. Right. It is teaching them to live like them. Let's talk about fornication versus you know, being pure in your life. Look, look at feminism teaches that, world, that, that women and girls can fornicate and relationships outside of marriage can be had freely without consequence. That's what it teaches. Purity is a joke and to the feminist, and it's looked upon as oppression by men. That's the way it's looked at. Here's, a, here's an article for you. Men's increasing unwillingness to marry stems primarily from two causes. Number one, the feminized family court system that transformed marriage, blah, 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 and the removal of paternal responsibility for the sexual behavior of young women. The need for marriage has been eliminated while its liabilities have increased. So look, this leads to that necessity of reproductive rights or the necessity to murder your children. As you're out there just fornicating freely and just living this lascivious lifestyle, I mean, you're just going to have, I mean, that's where it comes from. And now here's some irony for you. Here's some irony of the whole feminist movement. As of 2007, it was estimated that there's 40 million missing girls in India and 60 million missing girls in China. That's of 2007. It's hard to find these numbers today because they're trying to play this stuff down. Yeah. But basically as, as all the technology for um, ultrasounds so people can find out um, what if they're having a boy or a girl, you know, as, as sex selection technology ultrasounds became cheaper so even poorer people in these countries could do it, they're, they're aborting their, their female children. Because you can only have so many children in these countries. I mean, that's the true irony of feminism is what's given us free abortion everywhere around the world. And who's suffering? I mean, think about this. A little girl, I mean, here's the irony right here. A little girl who is aborted will never vote, she'll never work, she'll never wear pants, and she'll never raise a little girl of her own. There's irony for you right there. A hundred million. Who knows what it is today? Who knows what it is today? Men, men no longer need to marry. Think about this. And it's hard for you Christian men to think about this, but think about a man who has no religious convictions. Why in the world would he get married? Think about it. The median age from Pew Research, the median age at first marriage had reached its highest point on record. It's 30 years old now for men and 28 years for women in 2018, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Whenever something reaches its highest point on a graph that it's ever been, you better pay attention and figure out what's going on. But what's going on is this. I mean, the same article says the number of Americans living with unmar an unmarried partner reached about 18 million in 2016, up 29 percent since 2007, also a high point. There's a, you think there's a correlation there? Why did I ever get married? Why would a young man ever get married? Any woman would just move in with him. He no longer has to get married. Turn to, um, I mean, the Bible talks about this too. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7. Thanks to feminists, 
Young men today have just free access to women. And there's no, there's no need to get married. There's only risk to get married. There's only financial risk. I mean, all kinds of risk. Why would they ever do it? And that's why they're not doing it, by the way. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In a biblical society, a man who would like to like, have a physical relationship with a woman was, is required to get married. That's the way to do it, according to the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse number 9. The Bible, you know, Paul says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better for them to marry than to burn. So look, the Bible very specifically says, so look, if you have religious convictions, biblical convictions, you must get married. Amen. But most people don't have those convictions today, which is why marriage is at an all-time low. That's right. Because women would just move in with a guy, just another year they just move in with another guy, just move in, I mean, what's the point? It's crazy. How women think that this is good for them is, yeah. it blows my mind. How about women in the workforce versus keepers at home? I mean, this is a big one. Oh, you say that I should stay home with my children? I mean, uh, that's insulting. I mean, well, many women today will say, you know, I just have to work. I have to work. Here's some more irony for you. Women should today understand that their need to work is directly tied to the expectation that they will do so. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. In World War II, all the women in this country went to work. Okay, I'm going to just... I'm going to sum up a top-level generality for you. In World War II, the men went to war and the women went to work. The men came home from war, the women stayed at work. That's kind of how it went. So what happens when you have a workforce that's this big and then you double it? What happens to income? If you know anything about economics, you know that with supply and demand, that that drives prices down, that drives real income down. Real income is falling in this country. So basically, you have two families that are now required to work because of the fact that two, family, two people in the family do work. Right. Things are priced. Houses are priced. Cars are priced upon that two-income model. I mean, it's just, it's an, it, it's just what happened. It's a self, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Women who, would, <laughs> women who would work but rather be keepers at home, now, you know, they now say, I have to work. You know, say, thank you, feminism. You know, if women could speak, we could just say it all together now, but don't. I mean, the, like the ladies had a park day the other day. Like, like, they're all at the park playing and having, you know, fellowship at a park. I mean, I'm at work suffering. I mean, look, it, it's, not, it's not what you think it is. Okay, it's not what you think it is out there in the world. There's a reason that the weaker vessel is supposed to be home training and raising the children. Because you know what? Look. I've been in the workforce for 25 years and it's no place for women. I'll tell you that right now. Sometimes I wonder if it's a place for a Christian man. And, and, and you know, you say, well, how do you, do you, you know, how do you handle women at work? How do I handle women at work? I mean, because women are at my work. How do I handle it? Respectfully. I'm actually for all this anti-harassment stuff, you know, against women. I mean. I, I treat women at work like they're my daughter. And, and it seems like sometimes, it seems like I'm the only one that does. Yeah. Respectfully. Look, that's not my wheelhouse. Somebody else's wife is not my wheelhouse. It's not, but what I'm talking about, look, I have no authority over those situations. I'm trying to show you ladies what God wants for your life. Amen. That's what I'm trying to show you. you know, Spend some effort, you young ladies who aren't married, spend some effort becoming that virtuous woman. And then, you know, you'll get married and you, be, you can become that, that virtuous woman. And you don't have to go out there and kick against the pricks because that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be kicking against the pricks. You're going to be petting a porcupine the wrong way. If you go out there and, and do that, and you know what? You will lose your children. That will ultimately be the ultimate suffering for you. It's not a maybe. These schools, these care centers, they t they'll take your children from you. They're, they're wicked as hell and they will turn them. Why? You say, why? Because time is on their side. I mean, it's very simple. Time is on their side. If you're not keeping them, they're going to keep them. And you think, I'm going to bring them to church. Well, you're going to bring them to church for a few hours a week. They've got, they've got exponential time on their side over you. Because they're raising them. So ladies, girls, this feminism is a lie that will literally ruin your life. 
It'll ruin your life. And, and like, look, please, and, and I've seen this, I've seen this too many times in my life, but please listen now because you don't want to find this out. You don't want to say, oh yeah, that sermon was right when you're 40. You don't want to find out that these things are right when you're 40. Because there's going to be a lot of situations. By the time women are 40 in the United States, one in four of them have murdered their own child, at least one of them. I mean, you can't undo that stuff. You don't want to get to the point in your life where no moral man will marry you. You don't want to get to the point in your life where you can't redo certain, you know, certain decisions. You decided you're going to be this career woman and live, and then when you find out when you're 40 years old that you know what this is garbage and this isn't what it, you know what you know why it's not garbage to me, you know why I go out there and I fight that battle and I fight that fight every week. You know why it's not garbage to me is because it's what God has called me to do to support my family. Amen. That's why I do it to support my family. So there's a calling in it for me. There's a calling in it for me. But look, if you get to be 40 years old, you're like, oh, you know, I put off marriage and I put off all this stuff for this career that's it's a lie. You can't all of a sudden go and just have a family now. You can't redo those decisions at that point. So listen now. Listen now. Forget what you've been taught. It's all a lie. And this one's a particular, particularly evil one. Amen. Ladies, I, it doesn't matter where you came from. Your calling is to be a wife and a mother. That is what you're calling us to do. And it's, look, it's a life that, that is, is a life of, look, it's, it's a life of extreme value. Amen. It, it's of extreme value and honor Amen. in that. Because you're, you're not kicking against the pricks. That's your calling. That's your calling. Look, I've said to my wife a billion times, I mean, your role in this family is the most valuable. I mean, the, the, the next generation is in your hands. Look, well, because, I mean, it's not just about, look, it's not just about, oh, my role's a wife and mother, done. There's a lot to that. There's a lot to that. And few people are going to get that right. That's why her, you know, she's rare. Her price is above rubies. She's so rare. And look, it's like a, it's like a car, right? The, the, the woman in, is, is, the wife is the engine. You know, the, the guy is just driving, right? I go and I just, I make some money so we can have food in the fridge and we can have a place to live. But the, the children, it's in her hands. That is such a huge, it's the responsibility. It's the point. It's the main focus of the family unit. Think about the Old Testament. What were they constantly talking about? They're constantly talking about it. We talked about it in Judges chapter 1. They're talking about the next generation. Everything's about the next generation. The next generation. Don't forget. They're trying to warn and warn and warn over and over and over again. Don't forget. Don't forget the Bible. Because why? We know the Bible. Right? I know the Bible. But the next generation, they got to know. It's about the next generation. And then for them, it's about the next generation. That's why, like a generation and a half out, they fail. Because they forgot that. That next generation forgot the Lord. I mean, this is how, in, I mean, keepers, it's not about vacuuming. It's about the next generation. It is the most important thing in this Christian life. You say, we're squared away. The next generation has to be squared away. Amen. And there is so much pressure out here pushing against the next generation look it is impossible I am convinced it, it is it is near impossible if you do not get your role right in the family men you have to get your role right women you have to have your role right if you don't you're gonna lose the next generation right feminism will lead to a life of heartache and destruction not just of yourself but those around you Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.